Hello, everyone. This is Angelo Torlopas, and uh, today we have with us Jenny Androkaki, who has just got her PCC credential with ICF and had recently the experience with uh, the new ICF credentialing exam. So first of all, welcome, Jenny, and congratulations for your PCC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelos. And uh, yeah, okay, the exam was quite an experience, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I figure, and uh, I can only relate with a, a little bit similar experience I had uh, last year with the team coaching credentialing exam, but it's not the same. So I think since you have this experience and it's quite recent, I think it will be for the benefit of our viewers if you share uh, your insights and uh, um, tips and tricks you know and uh, how. Uh, which is one of the things that made you successful, of course, and your long uh, understanding, insights, and experience with coaching for so many years. But however, uh, understanding how to navigate the uh, uh, serious, uh, strict requirements, new requirements of the ICF credentialing exam, I think this is, will be a very beneficial for our viewers. So would you like to share a little bit of your wisdom on that? Yeah, wisdom or experience, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, I think maybe that's the right there for me. Okay. So, yes, as I said, it was a quite an experience and uh, it was a bit different from the CKA in uh, its essence, in its uh, procedures. And I, I think I, I have prepared. Um, a presentation, maybe, yeah, it could help us. So may I start sharing my presentation? Yes, I think that would be wonderful. Oh, okay, so we have some visual. Yes, let's have this visual aid uh, for the, to make things more um, easily to, easy to understand. Here it is. So let's go about the yeah, new ICF credentialing exam. It's not so new now, I think it's okay. In August, it's, all, it's a year. Okay, let's start on how do we get there? Where, when we have the chance to pass the exam, okay. Um, Okay, I will be short in that. Of course, we have to complete our ICF accredited training hours. Either this is portfolio or ACSD age hours or level one, level two, or ACTP. It's 60 hours for ACC and 125 hours for PCC. Uh, we need to complete our practice hours. 100 hours for ACC and 500 hours for PCC. And uh, we need to have our uh, sessions approved, recorded sessions approved, one recording, recorded session for ACC and two for PCC. And this is done either by ICF, if we go with portfolio or AC DSH, uh, or uh, if we go with level one, level two, or ACTP, uh, it's done by our school, uh, the approval. So then the process is a bit smoother. And of course, we have to apply. Oh, okay. Do you want to add here something? I can also. No, I think you have written everything. It's uh, quite um, easy to understand and explain for everybody so they can uh, look at all the details you have included here. I think that's very helpful. Thank you, Jen. Go on. Yeah. Okay, We then it's our, uh, uh, okay, we need to apply and we need to pay, of course, uh, for our application. Uh, again, if uh, somebody is an ICF member, that uh, saves them $150. If um, we go with the diploma for, of level one or two, this saves us about $200. And after our application, we wait for approval. Again, uh, the level one and level two diplomas 
because uh, they come with the um, sessions approved, um, they make us wait for four weeks only. If we don't go with that, then we need to, to wait up to 14 weeks because the ICF needs also to um, look through our transcripts and uh, recordings and approve. Yes, yeah, um, through the yeah. assess process and uh, mm. yes, they follow a rigorous process with different assessors and then they will try to find it if their uh, assessments are close. Uh, if not, they are, might want to engage a third assessor and that might take time. Yeah. Mm. Because actually you have to keep that in mind that assessors are ICF uh, members who are volunteering uh, in essence into that process. So that means that they are not um, staff, uh, they are not ICF staff, so it's not their full job, so it's something that they're doing on the side out of their goodness of their heart. <laughs> Hopefully good. <laughs> so after all these good people have approved our, uh, our sessions, okay, uh, finally, we get an email that uh, we can finally proceed with uh, scheduling our exam. And then we can schedule it within the uh, following uh, 60 days. Uh, once we schedule it, we get uh, an appointment confirmation and guidelines, which are really important. And we should read them carefully because they give us a lot of hints for going further. Yes, I think this is um, one of the main things that have changed, the guidelines and what you need to do. W would you like to tell us more? I think that you have prepared more on that. Yeah, okay, I will tell you. Yes. Okay, first, before, before I tell you all the practical guidelines, I think um, uh, I have here, okay, what we need uh, to really prepare for the exam. And, okay, we need to study the coaching competencies of ICF, the ICF Code of Ethics, uh, pay attention to the interpretive statements and the frequently asked questions. Okay, the values of ICF, the coaching definition of ICF. Of course, all of this we know already if we are at that point because we have uh, we have been trained uh, in this. Uh, but we can okay, we can review them. Uh, it, it can be useful. And of course, uh, have a look at the eight indicative scenarios with their answers, which is provided um, by ICF on the ICF uh, website, um, because they give us a, a good um, uh, a good view of what we expect we need to expect in the real exam. And of course, we can use we should use our knowledge and experience and our learnings from our discussions with our mentor coach or our supervisor. Well, this is so useful for the preparation. And let's go up. And let's go to the technical issues, which are uh, a bit important here because they have changed a little bit uh, from the CKA. And um, there is an upgraded uh, security system um, which actually ensures the reliability of our accreditation. It's quite important. And um, we will talk a little bit more about it. Um, by the way, we need also to know that um, the examination is uh, lasts three hours for the English speakers. And the non-English speakers uh, have one additional hour of examination as an accommodation. So in total, four hours. We need to know that there is only one five minutes break in the middle of the exam. So you better prepare that there will be only a five minute break. Uh, so to do what you need to do, whatever it is that you need to do in order to be able to go through that process. I think, Jenny, the most important thing, that the little bit unsettling thing here in that process is for a lot of people, for a lot of uh, colleagues that are going through this uh, new ICF credentialing exam are the technical issues and the requirements which are sometimes feel a little bit awkward. Uh, you made you made a good point that it, it's um, it's an upgraded security system. 
uh, that's been designed to ensure the reliability of the accreditation. So it is good to keep that in mind on the one hand, but on the, un well, on the other hand, I think you should be prepared for something, for a process that's very rigorous, might make you feel uncomfortable because you will be constantly monitored, and, but I think you will uh, share all these things. Uh, information and tips with um, our audience. So um, don't let me interrupt you. Please go on. Okay. If we pass the exam in an exam center, okay, this is uh, more straightforward because we don't have uh, to worry so much about the security measures. The exam center <laughs> takes care of them. And um, so all our personal belongings go in a locker. And then there is an on-site uh, proctor, an on-site supervisor for the exam. So we don't need to do anything ourselves, just prepare for the exam and go to the center. Um, okay, there are no centers everywhere. I understand now the ICF um, uh, has more uh, exam centers, as I saw at the update they sent us. Uh, so this is serving more people. But uh, if you go for... Um, uh, passing the exam remotely, then you have to take care of the technical issues. So uh, there you have uh, to understand that there will be an online doctor that uh, is uh, who is watching you through your camera. Uh, they will ask you to have your camera on uh, through the whole exam so they can watch you and you need to stay on your desk. And before starting, um, you need to clean your desk, you need to clean your room. Uh, that means nothing on the desk but your PC, not even a second screen, just on screen, and uh, nothing on the walls. And your PC should be free of whatever app. And uh, of course, there are some uh, instructions again on the system test that you can pass. And first, you, you, if you want, you pass it before the exam, before you go into the check-in, checking in. So that helps you. And then when you go to check in, uh, you pass it again. We are showing that everything is well. Ah. So before beginning the test, uh, you go into the check-in. And uh, this is 30 minutes before the scheduled appointment. All of this is on the guidelines they send you with a mail. Don't worry, you still have to remember everything just to, uh, just to remind what you need to go through. Uh, so yes, there is a system test. As I said, uh, they suggest that you do it also before the check-in. Uh, but when you go to check-in, there's a system test of your computer. Uh, there is the confirmation of your identity, of the identity of the examinee. And um, that means that you need to take a picture of your passport or your um, uh, ID and uh, a selfie. <laughs> uh, and some pictures around the office. And then, um, okay, uh, we send everything through an application. They send us on our mobile. And then they approve or they tell you to make some corrections if uh, they, uh, up, that's about the rule. And uh, about us personally, I think through artificial intelligence, they check if we are the same person that uh, appears on the ID card. So it's, it sounds like you're going through the uh, similar process, like you're starting uh, a new account on e-banking with a, with a new uh, electronic bank or some kind of some sort of thing. All these technologies and okay, yeah. so the selfie. Mm. Yeah, it is uncomfortable as you said, but okay. Once uh, you think more about it, okay, it's essential some way. Yeah, you know it, that. Yeah, I agree. It's essential. Uh, it's not very strange to the things that we do. I mean. Everybody knows what a selfie is, and probably we have uh, uh, took uh, already uh, tens of hundreds, perhaps, of selfies so far. But uh, we, we need to keep in mind that we have to go through some kind of process. And that's for the reason to verify uh, that uh, this is 
that we are the persons that are undertaking the the exam and not someone else. So I think that it's uh, it helps, as you said, Jenny, earlier to upgrade the security system on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, it upgrades the reliability of the whole credential. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So once we think about it, then, okay. It's also for us. You don't sound very enthusiastic. <laughs> okay, I was not. <laughs> it was like, and go for them. And then, I mean, and yeah, and I, I had to be very patient also with the instructions. Uh, they told me, okay, clean your desk, but it's clean. Okay, there was a landline uh, phone on it. Oh, no, take it off, take it away. Or put your mobile aside, but okay, not very far because we might call you, but it, it needs to be out of reach of your hands and all that. Okay. At some point I said, yes, yes, yes. And everything. Okay. Was settled finally. And then I was, and everybody goes at the end at the queue. Uh, yes, we wait at the small queue to start. It can be a bit bigger or a bit smaller. Uh, okay. I didn't have to wait so much about that. Maybe five minutes or so. And here, uh, I think we have to keep in mind, don't worry if uh, you see that the time has passed and uh, uh, it, so um, you should have already started with your exam according to the schedule. Once you are at the queue, don't worry. They just uh, You just go in and when you go in, then your three or four hours start. So don't worry about that. Uh, and then we start. <laughs> So what is the exam? Okay, let's go to the to the exam itself. Okay, the exam consists of uh, 81 scenarios with four options. Uh, we need to choose the best and the worst answer. And fortunately, they count separately. Uh, so that means that if you miss one, uh, the other one counts. So that's good. And uh, usually, there are two good and two bad answers, so you have to choose between the two good uh, and you have to choose the best and between the two bad, the worst. Uh, but pay attention, it's not always the case. There might be some questions that uh, there will be three good and one bad, so okay, just pay attention. Uh, that rule doesn't apply always, there are exceptions. And okay, there is a drag and drop system, so you just uh, pick with your mouse the good one, the, b the best one, and put it inside the box, uh, etc. So, let's talk a little bit about the essence of the test. Um, the scenarios are quite uh, realistic. So, that means that you might find uh, some scenarios, I mean, that you have found them in real life with your uh, clients and you have been there and you had to choose really what uh, you as coach should do because that's that's the question what the coach should do and uh, so yes that's very interesting um i found them quite uh, instructive actually uh, and then um they are I mean, they usually examine just one uh, coaching competence or one code of ethics rule. There's no order there. They try to be a little bit um, uh, fair in what comes to coaching competencies. So, so much percentage for this co coaching competence, so much for that, so much for that. I think you shouldn't worry so much about this, okay? ICF worries about that, so we are uh, examining the knowledge codes and competencies equally somehow. Uh, but pay attention to the fundamental ICF coaching principles. Uh, um, I saw them um, uh, a lot in the exam, that the clients should be at the center of the session and not the coaches. The clients choose what they want, in the session, there must be transparency, the part of the coaches, mainly matters of ethics and values, and uh, no directive questions, just curiosity. And actually we invite the customers to choose, we don't recommend solutions, and 
as coaches, we should be self-aware and aware of our conscious and unconscious bias. It's self-evident somehow, but it's quite essential to remember, I think, also when you pass the exam. I go on. I just don't, you don't want to comment anything on that? <laughs> no, I think that's uh, you. You are uh, explaining everything very well. So yeah, why don't we go on and see? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What yeah. else is there? Yeah. Okay. Some hints and tips for the correct the correct answers. Uh, okay, for sure. We know the coaching competencies and the code of ethics as long as our training is accredited by SEF, which is. And if in doubt, we ask ourselves, what would our mentors say here? Actually, I was asking myself, what would Angelo say here? Because he's been my mentor and, and he contributed to my success. And thank you for that, Angelo. Thank you. Uh, and um, we use what, what we know, so our knowledge and our judgments. Uh, because as coaches, we have over 100 hours of practice, at least. Uh, and we should pay attention not only to the words, but also to their deeper meaning. Because I have heard that ICF prefers uh, sure. uh, words like invite or ask. Uh, they don't prefer words like tell or suggest. Yes. Uh, but please look it into the deeper meaning and the context in the scenario, uh, because that might change the meaning. And here, okay, I got two indicative scenarios from uh, the ICF website, and maybe we can uh, see a little bit through that with Angelos mm -hmm. and. What is the, I mean, what is the reason? One is the best and one is the worst action, as it's uh, as it's said. Um, so this scenario is about uh, a coach who meets a new client and they arrange how to start their coaching sessions and the client starts a new business and actually uh, the coach... Um, at least um, here in the name of the new business understands that uh, the coach is an investor in another uh, business which might be a competitor to the same uh, to that business uh, of the um, of the coachee of the client. Uh, so what should the coach do uh, in that case? Yeah. And here are the, the answers. First, not say anything. And of course, you can read through uh, or share that, that the business name sounds familiar and make a note to see if it's really a competitor business. Share their role as investors uh, in the competitor business only if the potential clients uh, follows up to pursue coaching. And uh, finally, share openly their role as an investor in a competing business and acknowledge that there is the possibility of a conflict of interest with a client. Red is the worst and green is the best. And okay, initially I can say that, okay, the green is the most open uh, answer, the more the most transparent answer. Um, and so the coach is completely transparent to the uh, client, the client decides what to do. If we don't say anything, of course, we hide this information from the client. The other answers are somewhere in between that we are not completely honest. We are a bit, a bit honest if that exists, uh, but actually there is no clear transparency some, somewhere here. So what do you say, your Angelus? I think this is, uh, it's good to keep in mind uh, that this scenario is related to the Code of Ethics, and in particular, the section about the conflict of interest. And uh, as you know, uh, we should always be transparent with uh, conflict of interest. So the green one, the last one, is the best action because 
you are sharing uh, your uh, role and uh, the possibility of a conflict of interest so that the client, the potential client, can make an informed notice. Uh, so this is always good to be open, as uh, Jenny, as you said, Jenny. And the worst thing is not to say anything uh, which is disclosing uh, an information that might be crucial for the potential client to make a decision of whether he or she would um, decide to work with you or not. Uh, now, the other, uh, the gray ones or the black ones are conditional and uh, somewhere in between. Um, for example, to share the role as an investor, the good one says, only if the potential client follows up to pursue coaching with the coach. Not good enough because uh, you're not um, disclosing the information before the client makes a decision or start or engages in the process of making a decision. Uh, share that the business name sounds familiar and make a mental note to determine whether it's a competitor business later than that evening. Um, that doesn't sound like you are, that doesn't sound very sincere. Uh, yeah, because you know already that is the case. Yeah. You know, I remember one of the things that um, I have uh, heard from uh, a past president of uh, ICF Global, in which uh, she was a leader to Ray, and she said that when it comes to uh, when it comes to ethical challenges, it's always uh, good to stay in the comfort zone. So I think it's best to be as comfortable as you can be and uh, be transparent, open, and um, proactive and, um, if you can, if you, if you must, uh, so that um, the client knows what they need to know before they make uh, any kind of decision or engage in the process of making a decision. I think that proves to be a very good practice uh, because it safeguards your professional uh, profile, uh, the validity, the, the credibility of the coaching profession as a whole and the interests uh, of the clients. I think that when we um, look after uh, our clients' interests, we also look at sir, our profession's interests as well and um, credibility. And, yeah. And that applies, of course, to our whole practice, not only the exam. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. You want to move on to another one? Yeah. 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 Let's have a look. Okay. So that's about a client who struggles with delegating tasks to the other team members. And although at the last session, the client uh, said uh, that, uh, okay, they are going to delegate tasks to the other team members um, because they had a project which was falling behind schedule at the end. Uh, they decide to complete all the tasks themselves. Um, so at that case, uh, here they say the coach feels disappointment that the client did not follow through on their plans to delegate. So what should the coach do? Okay, one answer is immediately reflect back on the last session and what they could have done differently to support the client in following through their plans. Or take a breath and acknowledge that the client is responsible for their own choice of whether to follow through with their stated plans or not. Or set aside their disappointment for now, focus on the session and decide to reflect on the situation during a, an upcoming session with their own mentor coach. And finally, praise the client for meeting the project deadlines, but ask why the client failed to support their team members' development. So again, the, the green one, they take a breath, they acknowledge that the client is responsible is, uh, and 
uh, of their own choice. That's the best answer. And the last one that the coach still praises the client for meeting the project deadlines, but asks why the client failed to support their team members' development. That's the worst. Um, okay, I think, okay, as a first view, yes, the green one actually gives to the client the power and uh, the coach is the coach understands that the client is responsible for their decisions uh, while the last one actually uh, treats the client a little bit like child and they okay there are words like fail uh, to support it's a bit uh, I think it's not empowering at all <laughs> this uh, approach, but still Angelos, okay. You're... Well, thank you very much. I think you hit me some very valid points there. And uh, I'd like to further comment on the not good answers, the, the black ones, um, because uh, I think this is very indicative of the scenarios that you will face with during the, uh, the ICF credentialing exam. And it's good to have that in mind, that it, the, sometimes the answers are nuanced and uh, in other terms, they might seem to be a good answer. For example, the first one, immediately reflect back on our last session with the client and identify what they would, could have done differently to support the client in following through all their plans. Someone would say, why would that not be a good answer or a good uh, action forward? as a coach, because don't we want to be supportive of the client's process, development, and so on? Well, yes. However, uh, I think it's, it sounds like you are making a decision here for, um, instead of uh, respecting the client's decision or asking them what do they want to do in their session. So this is, in my opinion, the, the reason why this is not the good answer because you are making a choice there and uh, it should be the client who is making the choice. On the contrary, uh, the green one is, well, is it nuanced? Yes, and but it, it also takes a different stance. It shows that you are very well composed as a coach because as the scenario said, the coach feels disappointment. Now, should you feel disappointment? Well. Uh, it would be better if you don't feel disappointment. But however, uh, awareness that you do uh, fall into that kind of experience and feeling that of disappointment to um, be able to manage that, take a breath and acknowledge that the client is responsible for their own choices. They are the ones that call the shots. They are making the decisions. They can change their decisions. And you can ask the client what they want to do uh, from now on. Uh, and as the um, green answer says, uh, the clients are responsible for their own choice of whether to follow through with their stated plans or not. So this is what the clients choose to do so far. Why is the the red and the red one the red colored answer the worst answer because well there are many reasons that's right first of all because you are it's not like you are manipulating the client you are praising the client but you are uh, asking why they fail so there are a lot of um, there are a lot of answers that could be flagged here words like but and why and fail and things like that it's like um labeling it's like judging the client they have failed and asking the reason why is not always is not helping the client to develop and create awareness and expand their understanding and we know from the basic coaching techniques that we don't use close questions, we don't use questions, we avoid using questions with a why unless it's uh, very necessary. Uh, so yes, this is not a good way to go forward. Actually, it's the worst way to go forward. Um, 
The third one, which is not preferred, the black colored one that says set aside the so set aside their disappointment for now, for now, not forever. I mean, focus on for now and focus on the current session with the client. You cannot suppress your feelings because you will be in danger of them growing and uh, of growing resentment uh, that you will not be able to manage. Self management is very important for everyone, for our clients and most of all for ourselves to be in service of the client. Decide on reflecting the situation during an upcoming session with their mentor coach. It is not bad when you're feeling something that unsettles you, um, brings you out of your focus, to bring that into with uh, discussing with your mentor coach. Well, I would say with your supervisor. Uh, but... Anyway, if you don't have supervisor, mentor, coach, it's not a bad choice. Supervisor would be a much better choice for these kind of things because they will be would be able in in a coaching a supervision setting to do the kind of work, the co-reflective work that you need to do in order to understand better what is happening for you and uh, what else is available for you as a coach. Uh, so, still, it's a black colored answer. No. Why? I would say because you don't know what to do. It's lo you look like you are lost. No. To use a quote from Paul Bowles. So, are you lost? It seems like you are lost there. Something is being thrown at you that you cannot handle, and uh, you decided that you will um, uh, focus on that later with someone else, your mentor coach, or could be your super coaching supervisor. But it doesn't seem that you know exactly what to do with the situation at hand. So it's not a good choice. It's not a. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It seems okay, but it's not okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is my take. So very good scenarios. And I think that our viewers would enjoy because they would go much deeper into understanding and focusing on the nuances and um, dive deeper in the, 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 the mentality of how to work with, with our cases in their real life, in their real uh, coaching practice, as well as in the ICF credentialing exam. So what else have you got for us, Jenny? Okay. And more scenarios. Of course, you can see the rest of the scenarios on the ICF website. Okay, let's go to some hints and tips before we go into uh, passing the exam. So we need to arrange a day and time that is convenient for us, okay? And then uh, if we prefer an online exam and our network is not perfect, uh, it's better to choose a daytime when the network is not so loaded. So I know people who pass the exam on the weekend or pass the exam late at night. Uh, okay, when the network is not good, maybe that's a nice choice. But you, it's up to you, of course. It's good that we have eaten lightly, so we are not very hungry and we have rested. Uh, let's not drink too much of liquids like coffee or tea since there is only one break allowed and that's after two hours of examination. So, so in between the four hours. And uh, if we have three hours, of course, it's in between the three hours. Uh, we have already, it's a good um, a choice to already remove all non-PC items from our exam room um, to facilitate the check-in process so you don't have to do everything at once when uh, you are going through the check-in process. And um, also during the exam, okay, let's focus on the questions and after four hours we will return to our own reality, most likely with our new credentials. So that's that. That's the experience. So success to everyone and don't forget to celebrate. 
Okay. Celebration is important. It's part of the learning process. Yeah. I think that's great. And uh, thank you very much, Jenny. And I think people will be able to learn uh, more and uh, by visiting our website, positivityglobal.org, and uh, uh, or going to the YouTube channel uh, as well. Thank you very much. And uh, we wish everyone uh, great success. And remember that you will be going through a little bit of the awkwardness of the online proctor of the or the on-site proctor. But however, you will make sure that uh, you will be able to focus exclusively on the job at hand, on the one hand. And this is a very uh, credible um, process, examination process that solidifies the credibility of our coaching profession in general. And that was a very good point that you made there, John. Uh, Jenny, thank you. Very yeah. Much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we need to be comfortable, to be uncomfortable, to ask more and understand <laughs> why. Yeah. Why is that? There is a behind. Yeah. Thank you, Angelos, for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to share my experience here. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Jenny, and hope to have the opportunity to make another video if the situation arises. So see you on the next one. Okay, see you on the next one.